when you're 18 years old, you're not thinking about your return on investment. All you're thinking is I'm going to go to college and I'm going to pay for it however I can, which if it's student loans, it's student loans, right? And it's so easy to get student loans. I remember distinctly how I borrowed my first student loan. I got an email from the financial aid office. It says, congratulations, you got financial aid. Notice they don't say student loans, they say financial aid. I click this email, I open it up, it opens up the university website, right? I log in, it says, you know, click here to accept your financial aid. And you have to select what you want, which you are actually selecting student loans. You gotta put two and two together to know that. And then you click through a few more screens, you scroll through like a terms of service agreement, like whoever reads the terms of service, you know, we all see those every day. And then you hit I accept, it says congratulations, you're all set. This is the Personal Finance Show. Hi, I'm Bo Humphreys, and this is The Personal Finance Show. Robert Farrington wants you to think before you click the button and accept your student loans. Getting an education is an investment, and you should spend some time thinking about what you're investing in and what kind of return your investment will provide. For example, you may not even need a degree at all to work somewhere you like and that pays well. You may need a degree to get promotions and more responsibility later, but that might not be for a while, and who knows, your employer might even help pay for your schooling. We've been brainwashed over the years that to get a good job, you have to spend a lot of money on school and then eat ramen noodles while living in a tiny apartment and work 12-hour days to repay your loans. After the interview with Robert, I realized that some part of me is still brainwashed, and it actually scared me a little. Robert worked at Target for over 16 years. He mentioned this right at the beginning of the interview, and I totally didn't hear him say that he only stopped working there two years ago. So I kept asking him questions like, so what was your next job? Not fully comprehending that he was always a target until he decided that he was making enough from his side hustles and he wanted to spend more time with his family. I realized that there's this part of me that still finds it hard to believe that someone would work in retail for that long, and it's scary to think that I have these notions in my brain somewhere when I don't actively believe this is true. But on autopilot, the notion that guided me to my next questions were that he must have got a better job. No one works at Target for 16 years. It really sucks, but it seems I've been brainwashed to think that this is not a good job without even knowing what it is that Robert even did there for 16 years. Of course, there are people who spend their whole lives in retail and are very happy. Robert actually ended up with a lot of responsibility, managing several hundred employees and millions in sales. But he shouldn't be any less valuable to me as a human being if he simply pushed carts and stock shelves for 16 years instead. Especially when on the side he was building a web empire that now has millions of visitors per month. Even more ironic is that I've been driving for Uber since last September. And I'm sure there are people that think it's odd that someone with a university degree and 15 years working in accounting and finance would be an Uber driver but I actually really like it and it fits with my flexible schedule. I decided that even though all of this makes me seem like a classist jerk, I needed to talk about it. Maybe you do this too and you don't even realize it. Talking about it openly is the only way to shake off these archaic notions about what is good or bad, what is the right path, and all the other societal norms that seem to only cause us to spend money we don't have and take jobs we don't want. So, as Robert suggests, before we just press a button and fund our future with debt, we need to spend more time thinking about what it is we want. Are you going to be able to pay back this debt? What kind of job will you get after you graduate? If you're going to take on tens of thousands in debt, shouldn't you at least have a general answer to these questions? Why is the default, get the loan and figure it out later? Personally, I think we have it all backwards. We should try working in jobs in our areas of interest or curiosity, make some money, and then take whatever training or schooling is necessary to move forward in that area of work if we enjoy it. Why is a four-year degree the thing that everyone cares about? Logically, it doesn't make sense. Most people hire someone who works well with others 
and then train them how to do the job. We're focusing on the wrong things and it's creating a society that is trapped by huge amounts of debt. As Robert wrote in a post on his site, The College Investor, student loans should be your last option. If you do decide that you want to go to school before you have enough money to pay for it, there are so many options to explore before going straight to student loans. If you or someone in your family is in the process of deciding how to pay for school, I fully recommend going to thecollegeinvestor.com and reading everything you can. Robert joined me from his home in Southern California to share his personal finance story. My earliest money memory is probably in middle school. I was the kid that liked to earn money, right? And so I remember selling candy bars at break time and lunch time to earn extra money so that I could go to Blockbuster when Blockbuster still existed and rent video games when I was not in school. And so wow. my mom would take me to Costco and we'd buy like the 24 pack of candy bars, right? And then I would resell them individually at school and you know I would double my money and then I'd I'd reinvest and I'd next week I'd go back to Costco and I'd buy another pack and so, you know, I was making like five, ten dollars uh, every single week. But, you know, it gave me that extra spending money because, you know, I wanted to rent video games. That was, that's what I did in middle school. And my parents weren't about to give me the money. So I had to earn my own money. And that, that's probably one of my earliest money memories. How did you get your parents on board to do this? Because like, you, you needed their help to go get the bulk stuff at Costco. And then what did they think of your reselling? Well, I think originally, my, you know, they were skeptical, right? But like, sure. I know, like they, they fronted me the money and okay. I paid my mom back and, you know, it worked. And so like after the first time, it was, okay, as long as you want to keep doing this, like, you know, and you're paying for it, like whatever, if it's either going to work out or it's not going to work <laughs> out. But, you know, it really is only like five or ten dollars. And I think they appreciated that a lot more than me, like hounding them. I want to go rent a yeah, game. Good point. I want, yeah. like, five, give me ten dollars. You know, like versus like, hey, I want to go earn ten dollars, like help me out here. And so I think that was a little better approach. And, uh, you know, honestly, this is my earliest money memory, but I'm sure there was lots of begging for money prior to this memory. I just I don't have that memory. Right. I've, I've blocked that out as an adult. <laughs> of course. Of course. Do, do you think that that like being denied of the, the begging that motivated you to to think of these ideas or do you have like entrepreneurs in the family? How would you get this idea? We don't. I mean, honestly, my family, uh, you know, it was, it was always good with money, fine with money. Honestly, I, I do have early memories of my dad too. Like I remember he had a Quicken on this old PC okay, and wow. he would pay his bills and update Quicken like the old fashioned way, like entering the checks in the register. And I used to sit in his room <laughs> uh, in the office area and I'd watch him pay bills and I'd be curious about it. And my parents, you know, were they were always good with money. So it was, I, I had a good thing to watch and learn, but they also weren't like necessarily like giving me all the money. Like they were very much like you have to earn the money. You have to do something for the money. They did give me some allowance, but the allowance was tied to doing chores. I had to go mow the lawn if I wanted to get $5 or I had to go do something. So it was never just free money. Do you think that that is a bad thing for kids to be given money like for, for luxuries like a video game? I think they definitely need to earn it. Like, I think there's a baseline. Like, I mean, we should always make sure that kids have clothes and food and, you know, sure. school essentials, but there's the luxuries that they need to earn somehow. And they need to learn what the value of something is, especially like if it's a, it's, if there's a cost to the parent, there's not a limitless supply of money as much as we'd all like to have it. Right. And so like, we definitely need to correlate time and effort and value for kids because they don't have that understanding of it. Yeah. And I think some parents, uh, uh, they're trying to be good parents by giving their kids everything, but really they're it's not working out that way, right? Like they're they're being nice, they're they're not making their kid work hard, but then it's gonna affect them in the future. Right. I mean, I'm a dad of young kids. So, I mean, I have a five-year-old and a two-year-old and it's hard. Like you yeah. don't, you, you know, the harder thing is trying to see him struggle and fail. But on the flip side, you have to remember in your mind that like that struggle and that, that sometimes that failure is what actually helps them the most, not just giving them everything on a platter. But I mean, it's hard. Like it is a very hard thing to do. So I don't necessarily blame parents that want to give everything, but you do got to remember that like we got to teach the kids 
kids how to work for it and earn it and things like that. Seriously, like you are living my future. Uh, well, not with two because we only have one, but four months old. He's yeah. very, very young. And we're like, you're talking about, you know, uh, hard decisions to make. I, I had trouble like letting him cry it out in the crib. Uh, <laughs> right. I'm, I'm like, I'm like, no, we should just go get him. Let's just go pick him up, right? <laughs> like, if, if I can't handle this, oh man, right? So exactly. let's, uh, you know, st- so baby like I don't, steps, I don't blame right? the parents. I don't blame parents. No, at I all, don't blame but, them either. But yeah. on the flip side, like you gotta, you gotta let them try. You gotta let them fail. You gotta let them struggle. You gotta let them understand what value means because they're not getting that anywhere else except for what they see in the home. Yeah, absolutely. So you're learning about working for money really early which is it seems to be a commonly great thing to learn early and when it comes to money it, it helps you throughout your life <laughs> very entrepreneurial did the school end up putting a stop to it yeah i'm i like i do remember <laughs> like they were like a little like the do i remember duties right like the duties were like no no you shouldn't be like hustling out of your backpack and selling candy <laughs> bars but you know it was a good run while i had it so you moved to the sidewalk and said well i'm not technically on school property right, right? <laughs> like the like the scalpers right Did, exactly. uh, no you didn't go there you didn't go <laughs> no i didn't go there but you know what uh it, it was still it was a good run while we had it there did this lead then to you uh, is the next time you earn money for real uh, like an actual job so my parents were very into playing the card game bridge and uh, they would go on the weekends to like uh, a bridge studio and they'd play against all these other people and there would be like tournaments and i mean it's, it was like a big thing and i just yeah, remember too big. so like after like middle school i was probably like 13 at the time i guess that's probably still middle school age i was a caddy and what the caddy would do is i would collect the cards i would pass out the cards i would take their scorecards and enter them into the computer i would like uh you know just basically be like the errand boy but like i was making like i think it was like five bucks an hour and so like for like an afternoon i was getting like 20 25 dollars for doing good. this and uh it was really yeah it was my choice it was like i either go with my my mom and go down and, and caddy for bridge or i just sit at home alone and you know play legos or not have any money for video games because i didn't go out and earn it right so the That's question right. was uh, what do I want to do? And so I remember doing that quite a bit. And I was doing that consistently for a few years, just caddying at the bridge studio uh, and earning extra money that way. What a very specific thing. Like, you know, people say caddy, you think golf, of course, but caddy for bridge. Yeah, yeah. I didn't even know that that was a possibility. So you're I, just, you're getting spending money at this point. You're, you're, exactly. you're like a new teenager. When do you get a job somewhere else where, where you're maybe earning some money that can enable you to do a little more than just pocket money? Yeah. So my first job, my real quote unquote real job, right, is uh, I started at 16. My mom bought me a truck, like a, a really old beat up truck for wow. like 2,500 bucks when I turned 16. Okay. Uh, I was stoked, right? Like this actually like this dented up truck comes into the driveway my mom's <laughs> like i bought you a truck you know it like barely ran it had a lot of issues but it was a free truck for me right and she's like uh, if amazing you want it, if you want it though you have to pay for your gas and your insurance so you better go get a job and uh i don't even know why we didn't even take the truck but she took me to the mall and dropped me <laughs> off at the mall and was like Call me when you get a job and I'll come pick Seriously, you up. Seriously, that you just that's how it happened. She's yeah. like just here's here's where you get jobs. Exactly. So she took me to the mall, <laughs> our local mall, and I, I remember very distinctly I started like Starbucks is at one end and Target was at the other end, right? And so I started at Starbucks and like I applied and then I just kept walking down different mall stores and then I ended at Target and Target interviewed me on the spot and hired me and literally that's how I started working at Target and that's that was like my first real job and I did that all the way through high school until about two years ago so that's so random it's like right? it's you're like you're not like sitting at home thinking oh i i'd love to work at target or it's just like i'll work where, wherever they hire me 100 <laughs> percent. i just needed a job to earn money so that i could drive my new truck like you know it, that's ama- it, it, it's very fundamental like i just need to earn right like i, I i'm liking your mom right now like she's <laughs> she's buying you this truck as a, a and then gives you the incentive like you're like oh awesome truck well well you need a job though right yeah. it's like she was subtly manipulating you oh absolutely. which is so awesome <laughs> and what an incentive though because like not everybody has i think a lot of kids don't have incentives to get jobs 
Exactly. Right? And I, I honestly very much value the fact that I worked early. And, I, you know, I didn't necessarily put this value on it then, but like fast forward to now. Sure, and sure. that early working and being able to work while I was in high school, because I was working about 20 hours a week while I was in high school. Luckily, I was like in my like last years of high school. And so I would get out every day at like, you know, I think my senior year, I was getting out of school at 1230 because I only had yeah, like nice. four or five classes. Right. So I get out at lunchtime and then I'd go work from like two to six every day and then like i'd be done so i mean i'd still be done with my day at like 6 p.m and i'd still have the nights and and whatnot so but being able to balance working and going to school and learning things like business communication and business problem solving and yeah. things like that like those were much more valuable skills than taking ap calculus in high school nothing against that but like you know, I've never used calculus since then, right? And uh, I definitely use my business communication and problem solving skills every day. Absolutely. Do you know, like, are there incentives to go and get actual jobs? Like, are there classes and stuff like that for uh, high school students? They make it very hard because, you know, at the end of my target career, I was hiring a lot of people, right? And, uh, you know, even working a retail job is the, the, the restrictions make it very hard and they don't incentivize employers to hire young adults. So really? in, in California here where I'm based is if it's a school day, you yep. couldn't employ a minor more than three and a half hours. Oh, really? Right. And if it was a non-school day, they could work eight hours. But they also include Sundays to be a day before a school day. And so it was that three and a half hour rule again. So if you're really, an, yeah. So if you're an employer, though, hiring someone for just three and a half hours can be very challenging. And so yeah. for me, it wasn't a question that I didn't want to hire minors. Like I love to actually hire young kids. Like they had energy. Like it was my story. Like I really wanted to hire more young adults. But the laws made it so difficult to employ them in an effective way that it just was very challenging to find places that you could actually have minors work that would be conducive to your business. And this is a retail store and I can't imagine what it would be like in other stores. Yeah. So like we're trying to give kids opportunities to learn this stuff early, which you know is so valuable now. Totally. But uh, there's so many roadblocks in there. Exactly. Interesting. Yeah. So that's probably why a lot of kids don't you get actual jobs uh, until maybe university and not even because, of course, if a parent or someone is paying for, and, and again, in the U.S., way more expensive, a university, why would they want the person to go and, and work and and not uh, make the most of this hundred thousand dollars or whatever it is they're paying. Exactly. I mean, it's just it's a catch twenty two, right? Like they need mm. to work and we need them out there, but we make it hard for them to work. And then on the flip side, like if they've never worked, they are I don't know scared. Psychological barriers are there too. Working, they don't know if they can work and balance during school. Where it's kind of like I was forced into it, and so I know it's doable. But I look at someone else that might never have been exposed to it. It's not necessarily so much that they can't do it, but you know, there's probably some mental blocks there to being able to do it. As much as there is, there's not a financial need per se. Well, high school seems like the best time because it's like the consequences are so low. What, what if, like, if, if yeah. you don't pass calculus, you take it again in the summer? I don't know. It's not going to ruin your life, right? Oh, but see, for you, now, both of us are past that phase, so it doesn't That's ruin right. lives. But when you're living that moment, it ruins oh, your yeah. life, right? Yeah, like, you, right. Have, <laughs> you have to, like, think about that because, you know, that is all there is in the world, and your friends are going to make fun of you, and your family's going to put oh. shame on you, and your, your whole life is ruined at 17 because you didn't pass calculus which we know is a total farce but that's how you feel in the moment right <laughs> yeah kids are terrible i <laughs> i'm so far past that i've forgotten right, right. oh like, man it's, it's make or break in high school every moment counts <laughs> so you got to be able to do school and make like i don't know maybe you start slow i don't know what the right answer is here but, so you worked at target and you mm -hmm. did well and well enough in high school Yep. I mean, I graduated near the top of my class. Uh, I went to college. I actually really struggled my first quarter of college. I was still working full time. Um, I was on academic probation. I didn't fail anything. Okay. But I had two C minuses and a C plus, which, you know, averages to like a 1.9 GPA, which is less than like your 2.0. And so like, <laughs> I was like, on, I got these nasty emails, like you're on academic probation. Like if you don't like fix yourself, like we're going to kick you out. And 
granted, I figured it out and I improved dramatically from there on out and graduated with honors by the time I was done. But it was a it was a game changer. Like it was very different than high school, and uh, it took me a little bit to figure it out. Were you still working at Target? I was. I worked all the way through, and I actually started working. F- close to full time when I went to college. So I was working 32 to 40 hours a week while I went to college. Okay. So who paid for school? How did, how was that paid for? By myself, a little bit of help from my parents and uh, student loans. So the money you're making at Target, were you able to save a lot of that then? I saved some of it. I didn't save a lot of it. A lot of it was going to living expenses and college and, you know, yeah. having fun. Uh, but, you know, I did, as soon as I was eligible for my 401k, I put 5% in and uh, I really? was saving a little bit here and there. And honestly, I was more saving because I was very passionate about investing and, you know, kind of seeing my money grow. So I put in like 100, 200 bucks every month into like an investment account and I would trade stocks and things like that, uh, wow. which I've since learned a lot of lessons, which started, which is one of the reasons that propelled me to start the blog. But I was saving a little bit, but I was also losing some in the stock market and learning some lessons that way as well. <laughs> Because you didn't ha- you didn't talk about any of this stuff with your your parents or anything, right? Investing. I watched my dad's portfolio on Quicken when I was a kid, but like I didn't talk to him about it, and they definitely didn't know that I was like you know trading stocks in college. Like I wasn't talking to them about it. wasn't really talking a ton about money with them at that point in time. Yeah, why? Why do you think that is? Was it like a bad thing to trade stocks when you're when you're that young? Or I mean, I don't think it's a bad thing to trade stocks. I think it's actually I do think it's a bad thing to trade stocks. But on yeah, the flip well, side, too, but, yeah. when when you're young, it's like I think it's the best time to learn some hard lessons. When you're early on. So I actually had a problem and my problem is different than most is some of the first stocks I ever picked, I knocked it out of the park. Okay. <laughs> like I'm talking like I turned $200 into like $2,500 and so like you, seeing like you did a huge good job. gains. I did a great oh, no. job. Right. But that gives you like really extreme confidence when you're like 19 years old that like I, I'm a stock. You're a stock genius. genius. Yeah. OK. <laughs> and, and then, then and then you uh, learn some hard lessons about like, no, I'm actually not like I just had some early wins that were probably very bad for my uh, confidence and knowledge and pocketbook. Right? Well, that's an interesting parallel. I'm sure I've mentioned I went through a long gambling addiction. Yeah. And the early wins are a big thing that propels people into gambling in the first place. And it's just so like, so did it have any like really negative effects on you? Or was it just like you didn't do so well later on? It just didn't do so well. So like, you know, I kept it to what I had. Like, you know, the one thing that's hard about, you know, being 19 years old is you're not being able to take out credit. You're not necessarily being able to mm. trade a ton on like margin when you don't have a lot of money in your investment account good, um, good. so like you know there's no <laughs> debt going on from it but it was like you know i, I took like 200 to 2500 and then a year later my account's back down to like 1200 right gotcha. yeah. <laughs> like it just never saw the it never repeated the success but on the flip side like i also that propelled me to start my blog that propelled me to learn more about how you should be investing how you should be saving um and then i've you know since changed my philosophies around how you should invest for the long term and all the other stuff that you hear in, on every personal finance podcast about low cost index funds and long term investing. Of course, but I learned that the hard way. <laughs> yeah, and we'll, and we'll and we'll get to that, uh, of course. Uh, sure. But at this point, you're just figuring it all out. And so that you made an interesting uh, point that you weren't at risk for using debt because of your age. Is it was it 21 in the states for credit cards? You know, when I was in college, I think it was still 18, but they've okay. since like you know change the laws to like be 21 and they have all these things where you can't market credit cards on campus and and, you know a lot of different variables okay but you couldn't have a margin margin account you you weren't allowed to have that i think i could have but i also don't think i had enough money in my investment account where they would approve it right you weren't big enough yeah i wasn't you know i had like two thousand bucks uh you know at the peak at this point in time and so it's like okay maybe they would have given me a thousand but like i don't even think i knew how to do that or much about that yet right (laughs) You knew like you could only use the money that you had. And was this extra money or was it money that you could have like spent on things or? This was definitely extra. I mean, this was money I had from my earnings. So like when I was working yeah. at Target and I was putting like 50 to 100 bucks in every month or every two months when I had some extra money. And uh, yeah, I was I was using that to invest and trade with. And then, so you have these student loans, though. Uh, I do. So, like, that's the interesting thing. So, like, I had savings and investments. But yeah. like everyone just said, like how you pay for college is 
borrowing. So like I also had student loans. It wasn't like trying to eliminate my debt or live debt free because like I just didn't have that mindset or knowledge. So it was like I was borrowing okay. to pay for college and I was still working and earning and saving a little bit over here on the other side too. <laughs> well, what's like uh, what's a typical interest rate? Well, then or or today, you know, if you get student loans. I think my interest rate then was like uh 6.4% or something like that. And today I think it's gone down a little bit. I think uh the new interest rates are like 4.55% for federal student loans, which is all I had. I only ever took out federal student loans to to pay for college. You have to pay that interest rate away? That's the crazy part. So when you're in school, your loans are deferred. So the interest okay. still accrues and your loan oh, grows, that. but you it's don't have worst. to pay it. <laughs> uh, everybody thinks that nothing's happening to it, and then you get this big balloon at the end. Right. And so that's like when I was set in, you know, like when I graduated, and you have six months of deferment after you graduate too. So like when I actually started repaying my loans, um, it had grown up to about uh, $42,000, $43,000, the high water mark of my loan. So did you then get a job like a, or are you still working full time like at so Target? So I still after worked full time at Target and I got promoted and so luckily uh, I got 40 I think my first job or my first assistant manager role I was making $42,000 a year. So I was stoked, right? Like I had uh, <laughs> I had this debt I didn't really care too much about it. Everyone has student loans, right? That was my mindset. Yeah, yeah, sure. But I just like doubled my salary. I was making $42,000 a year at, you know, 22 years old like this is good stuff right here. That's, that's actually not bad. That's uh, I mean, I think I started at thirty something. I'm I'm sure at that age. Yeah, exactly. And then I mean, I got some raises pretty quick. So I think within two years, I was over fifty. I was at maybe like fifty, fifty five. So I was feeling pretty good um, after I graduated. Um, so much so that I even went out and bought myself a new car. Uh, which nice. is another like folly of personal <laughs> finance, but you know, you live Absolutely. these lessons and you learn it, right? Because I was like, I was the shit at that point in time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, I mean, it sounds it sounds good, right? And and are you able to maintain your payments on the student loans? And is everything being taken care of? Is that yeah? All so happening? I mean, I mean, I was working. I was paying my loans. I was paying my car. I I also was a big on side hustling. So my side hustling never stopped, right? Yeah. So like I okay. started the blog. I, at this point in time too, I was very big into reselling stuff on eBay. So nice. I was uh, going to garage sales and estate sales and selling stuff on eBay. And my side income at that time was about one to two thousand dollars a month just from my side hustle. So wow. between my earnings and my side hustling, everything was good. Yeah. Okay. So you're you're doing good. Is there a point where it goes wrong? <laughs> goes wrong? <laughs> Not a point that goes wrong, but you know, this is also when my wife and I were getting serious and dating. And yeah, uh, okay. I'll tell you yeah. that, like, so. I'm a big I'm I'm big into the earn more if you haven't heard that yet in my voice. I like the side hustles. I Absolutely, like the yeah. But she's the financial analyst of the family. Okay. So okay. she's the savvy one and I give her full credit and she just kind of like sits down and you know we're starting to mingle our money and we're looking at each other's finances and she's like why the heck do you still have these student loans? Like, why aren't we paying these off? And yeah. you know, why do you have this car loan? Like, why don't we pay that off? Like, why don't we make some goals here and start like really like snowballing and throwing all this extra money into these debts and get debt free? And so she was really the catalyst. Um, I see. You know, in my early twenties after college, when we were making some good money at, at least in, for that point in time, um, to like start eliminating this debt. Yeah. So because you're doing great, you're making money, but like you're, you still have lots of debt and are, but are you able to save? Like, are you saving any of it? Like, you know, I was still fiddling around with investments. So yeah, I was still yeah. putting money in my 401k and taking advantage of the match there, but like I wasn't maxing it. I was just doing my, so target would match dollar for dollar to 5%. So I would wow, put my five, great. it was a great match, but I, you know, I was like, I was just getting my 5%. I was putting 5% in, they'd give me 5%. And then, you know, I was still fiddling around, but you know, we kind of shut down all the extras. My wife and I like, we're like, we're not throwing any more into like the, your random trading account here like we're gonna take yeah. all that extra money and we uh, eliminated our car loan and we eliminated all those student loans and the cool thing is is we were able to eliminate all those debts um, in about two and a half years after I graduated um, between my working her working as well and the side hustle income that we were bringing in um, eliminated all of it 
Why? So why is that important? Why? Why can you just let it go for a bit, pay it off slowly? Is that uh, is that not an option as well? It's totally an option, and I think you just have to look at the math. I think you know her analytical mind is like you know six point eight interest rate. So like by eliminating yeah. that, it's like a guaranteed six point eight percent return. I think the car loan was even better. I think the car loan was like one point nine percent, like nothing. But it's like you know seven hundred dollars a month because it was like a three year loan, and it was like why don't we just get rid of it just pay that off like we can like what's the point of having this payment and so like for me i think i was very much in a payment mentality at that sure. point in time in my life like i could afford all my payments my income just cash flow expense. right yeah, cash flow is good bro. you just put it here and there yeah whereas she was very much like a an assets and liability mentality and like we can throw all that extra money into savings and investing and like really grow that over time because you didn't have any any goals at this point for your future financially or anything like that not terribly like personally you didn't yeah no like not terribly it was really as we started getting together like our first goal is really my wife's was like get rid of all this debt so she was also blessed that she didn't have any student loans when she graduated her nice. parents were able to um, pay for college she had scholarships like her first two years and then she went to uh, the state school and it wasn't too bad and her parents paid off you know paid for her college those second two years so yeah wow so you're starting the the blog in in university at this point and when you're done like is it getting traction already or and what are you writing about at at the start yeah so i started my senior year of college and uh it was just a side, one of my many side hustles at the time i was like re i was very passionate about earning and investing and so i was always reading yahoo finance and i was reading other personal finance blogs and i was like i can start one too like i you know i don't just in my mind I could and so sure. I was like I'm gonna share my random trading and investing ideas which I had some success with at that point in time yeah, yeah. with the world right like who doesn't want to hear what some 21 22 year old <laughs> has to say about investing but I was gonna do it and uh, that's really what perpetuated me to start it and uh, my first blog posts were all that kind of stuff it's like you should buy XYZ stock and here's why I think you should and this is where I think it can go and it didn't go anywhere but I was very passionate about it and uh, I kept at it. <laughs> And the do the domain like was it college investor at that's that point? That's why that's why my site is called the College Investor. You know, literally, I was in college and I was an investor. <laughs> so that's that's it, and that was available at this time. What year is this, by the way, that you uh, would have started? This would have been uh, two thousand nine. There were ten years this year. Yeah. Yeah, ten years. Yeah. So I guess I mean. Is it the college investor or college investor? It's the college investor. You know, to so this was... date, I still can't get that domain. It's there. Oh, yeah. Oh, somebody's got it. Okay. Someone's got it. They won't <laughs> sell it. They won't contact me. I've tried. So, you know, live and learn. But, hey, what are you going to do? I feel you. I, I own investwisely.ca. It's my website. Investwisely.com is actually also owned by a Canadian. Uh -huh. And it's just got like a picture of a, a house or some kind of property that they're selling. And I reached out and I said, hey, are you going to do anything with this? And they're just holding out. I don't know if you did the same thing to your college investors. They just people. won't ever respond. I've tried. It's just really like, it's Even. there. It's ghosted. I have it like, I'm like, I watch it from time to time to see if they don't renew it. And they do. So you know, what, <laughs> what are you going to do? That's it, right? I mean, you, I, I, I heard that you get enough traffic already, so I think you're all right, right? I think, yeah, I think we're all right. But you always have to say the, the college investor. That's hey, I mean. I'm, I'm the personal finance show. The does, I don't know. <laughs> uh, they, sometimes that's what you need to get to get it right. So it that's wasn't it. going anywhere though at this point. No, and I wasn't doing anything. It wasn't making any money. It wasn't getting any kind of traction. Like, but it was a, it was still a passion project, right? I loved it. I like to share my ideas, so I was still keeping at it. So you like you weren't thinking about is was this considered to be one of your side hustles at this point? Yeah, or, like I considered no, just it more a like a hobby. hobby. Yeah, it was yeah, just like a okay. hobby. Um, I had you know I think I had some goals in the back of my mind to earn money because you see some of these other blogs. They, people course, were sharing yeah. people were sharing their income reports back then even, and it was like yeah. wow, you read these income. Reports and like that's what's possible, uh, so that was really <laughs> exciting to see. And so I kind of like you know I wanted to get there, but like I wasn't going anywhere at this point in time. So you're paying off all your student loans. So, so not like are you clear now? You're debt free at some point. Yeah, two and a half years after I finished school, um, we yeah. paid off all the loans, the car loan, the student loans, and um, the only thing we had, we had, we bought a house at, by that point in time, and so we had a mortgage, and that, that was it, though, and uh, everything That's, else, yeah. all consumer debt and gone. 
Yeah, oh, that's amazing. And so did you start writing about, or you continue to write about all this stuff that you're going through, the paying it down quick? Is that all on the blog as well? Yeah, so one of the first things that I branched out of outside of investing was student loans. So yeah. as I'm paying down my student loans, my loan servicer was jacking up my payments and wasn't applying. Like I would pay like extra principal payments and they weren't applying them correctly. They were putting them all towards the interest and, and really? doing weird things. And okay. I wrote about this and how I was like, battling with them and how they were terrible yeah. like their customer service was terrible and like <laughs> they were lying to me on the phone and like awesome. you know like I had to like send certified letters and it was a mess yeah. right and this blog post was like the first one I think I ever got like a comment on and like it was like I started getting more comments and like people were saying like oh my god that's my problem too it's happening to me yeah issues and okay. wow like this is terrible and like I've been battling them I and so I was like wow people like like I'm getting people like actually reading my stuff, which is really cool. <laughs> like people are commenting, yeah. which is really cool. And so I was like, maybe I should write more about student loans. So I think I turned that first blog post into like a series of like five different ones, all about my loan payoff journeys. And then I started branching out and learning more about student loans. And so I kind of really started talking about how to get out of debt early so that you could start investing and building wealth early. And that, that's kind of been my philosophy ever since on the site. Yeah, it's very, very applicable. I mean, you do you have stats on uh, the number of student loans in the States right now? Yeah, I mean, this last year they passed $1.5 trillion in outstanding student loan debt, and that's about uh, 45 million borrowers with student loans. And that number just keeps growing, right? Every graduating class now is just having more and more student loan debt. And I feel like the this deferment thing is just got to be the worst. Is, is this what makes people's debt grow so fast? No, the biggest thing that makes people's debt grow so fast is that, well, there's two aspects. It's it's borrowing beyond the ROI of your student loans, oh, right? Yeah. So like when you're 18 years old, you're not thinking about your return on investment. All no. you're thinking is I'm going to go to college and I'm going to pay for it however I can, which if it's student loans, it's student loans, right? And it's so easy to get student loans. I remember distinctly how I borrowed my first student loan. I got an email from the financial aid office. It says, congratulations, you got financial aid. Notice <laughs> they don't say student loans, they say financial aid. Wow. Okay. I click this email, I open it up, it opens up the university website, right? I log in, it says, you know, click here to accept your financial aid. And you have to select what you want, which you are actually selecting student loans. Like, you know, you got to put two and two together to know that. And then wow. you click through a few more screens, you scroll through like a terms of service agreement, like whoever reads the terms of service, you know, we no all one. see those every day. And then you yeah. hit, I accept, it says, congratulations, you're all set. Boom. You're the winner. I you have, won. you know, that was like my first year. It was like $12,500 or something in student loan debt in like wow, five, min how, five minutes with like no That's how easy effort. it is. That's how easy it is. And so like when you're 17, 18 years old, you get this email, you take out loans, you go to school, you're not putting two and two together. And that's why student loan debt is a problem. Just like any kind of debt, debt itself isn't bad. If you want to go buy a house, getting a mortgage, it's not necessarily a bad thing. The real question yeah. is, can you afford it? What's the yeah. value of the house? How much are you borrowing? There's all these factors. Well, the same is true with your student loans. What do you want to do? What career path do you want? How much are you going to borrow? What do you expect to earn after graduation? Like these are all the kind of things that young adults need to be thinking about when they borrow and the ones that do are usually okay it's the ones that don't and they borrow one hundred and fifty thousand dollars to go to a private school when they only wanted to be a teacher and they're going to make forty five thousand dollars a year and now mm. they're struggling because they have a massive amount of student loan debt to be a teacher which didn't require any of that stuff of going to private school and, and doing all you know spending all this money you could have gone to a community college in a state school and spent ten thousand dollars dollars and been a teacher. It's just we don't walk through what the end result is. We just say, go to college, go to college, and don't think about the ROI. Who's making these choices? Is it the, is it the parents? Is it like, you got to go to this great school? Is it the high schools that are saying, oh, you got into this school, so good for you. Now figure out how to pay for it. All the above. Uh, yeah. So one, we're asking 17 and 18-year-olds to make life decisions, which is challenging, right? Yeah, what you, yeah. <laughs> what do you want to be when you grow up, right? Like a lot who of knows? them don't, who knows? And that's yeah. part one is I'm a big believer that college isn't the time to find yourself. It's too darn okay. expensive. 
Yes, right? yeah. Like maybe you need to take a year and go study or explore, and which is more common in other countries than the United States. Like I was talking to some Australians at, last year at FinCon, and like in Australia, it's super common that they all take yeah. a year off and travel. You take like, your year. And, yeah. then, and then they come back and go to university. Like we don't do that here in the States, and maybe we should do more of that. When they make some money usually right? during that year, so at least a little bit anyway. Exactly. Right? So I think that's part of it. Um, number two is like what are you going to college for? Like do your research. Like if you want to be a doctor, go be a doctor. That's great. You need to do university. You need to do special programs. You're going to take out a lot of debt, but like you know what your earnings are going to be after graduation. But the yeah, same is true to anything. Do you want to go, even if you want to do something as general as I'm going to do business, I want to go into a business. Well, it's like, you know, an entry level business career pretty much anywhere is going to be like 40, 50, maybe 60 if you're maybe. lucky, but that's like if pushing it, right? But you're probably yeah. going to be in the 40 to 50 range, entry level salary at like some white collar business job. Okay, well then mm. don't go borrow more than that. I'm, my, my rule of thumb is don't borrow more than you expect to make your first year after graduation. That's smart. So if you're going to make 40, well, you can borrow $10,000 a year for four years of college. Now, okay. with some math, which that's that's reasonable amount of tuition, right? But maybe that's not enough. Maybe you need to apply for more scholarships. Maybe you need to go work. There's ways that you can supplement this income as well. Maybe your parents had a little bit of savings and they're going to help you a little bit as you go. Like college also doesn't have to be a hundred percent loan funded, right? It can be funded by your earnings, your savings, your parents' earnings, your parents' savings. You could apply to a thousand scholarships. Like if you don't work in high school, well, maybe your job needs to be applying for scholarships. And when I say applying for scholarships, I'm talking about applying to like a hundred and 150, like a lot. Cause it's a numbers yeah. game, right? Like if you have a 5% conversion rate of a scholarship application, we'll apply to 20 and then you're going to get one. <laughs> right. Yeah. And then if you apply to 40 and then you're going to get two, Right? Like the math is just if you apply to more, you have a higher likelihood of getting a scholarship. It teaches you a bunch of skills too for the future, right? Like uh, calling and selling and, and marketing yourself and all that kind of stuff too. Absolutely. And so, like, I don't want to dismiss anyone from going down any certain career path. Like, we need teachers, we need art historians, we need some of these liberal art majors, we need professional academics. Like, we need those in our society. But on the flip side, you don't need to spend $150,000 to be any of those careers you can also no. do it with different paths and different ways to pay for it right yeah that's it just seems like so okay so there's this, there's two situations that you got the the kids we you got to figure out what it is you want to do well that might be hard mm -hmm. so if you don't know specifically like if you're not like this passion like i want to be a doctor then maybe don't Go. There's like hold, hold off, hold right. off. Wait, wait till you do figure it out. Go work, or you know, go to a community or a state school, and take out your general education classes. Knock them out for cheap, right? Okay. It's like in, yeah. in California and a lot of states now. I mean, going to a community college is so cheap, and many states are making that free, and you can knock out your general education classes. Same thing with your in-state schools. Live at home, maybe. And like, you know, go for really cheap and even see if college is worth it because maybe college isn't for you, but maybe you weren't exposed to other career opportunities and maybe just getting outside the house a little bit, going out on campus will expose you to something that you're actually more passionate about that you didn't know at first. Yeah. So, yeah. So if you don't, if you don't know, don't do it. Like if you're not a hundred percent sure, don't do it. And then, yeah, like look at, like, don't be... I don't know, maybe did shows like Community make uh, community colleges look bad or something? Like, what's we we don't ha we have a lot uh, of different options here in Canada, right? It's like you know, it's cheaper to go to to a really good university here, of course. Right. Uh, and colleges are, they also have great programs if you know specifically what you want to do, right? So it's like, in my opinion, uh, in my view, in Canada. Uh, university is for like the more broad degree that everybody you know knows about, and the the college is like I want to be you know a catering manager. I want to you know I want to work in sports and entertainment, right? Those kinds of things. So th they're great for adding on or where where to start if you have a specific job that you want to do. None of it is extremely expensive like the Ivy Leagues in the states. And right. I just wonder why do we need these uh, amazing universities? if they just throw people into debt? Is it just for the rich people? What's happening? 
Well, I mean, I think everyone has the opportunity to go even to an Ivy League where I think the problem is, is that colleges, colleges view students as customers, right? Yeah, okay. And so when you're looking at customers, it's, it's a business. So how am I going to compete for customers? Well, like 20 years ago, the main competition was academic rigor and, you know, how an academic program is viewed. So these colleges were investing in great professors. And then, you know, to entice a professor, well, you got to give them some assistance and you got to give them a research budget. So, you know, that yeah. costs money. Well, then you pass that money on to... Uh, the students, right, in form of higher tuition. Well, once, you know, you had a lot of colleges have great academic programs, well, then it's facilities. Like, we need to have the best, you know, facilities and lecture halls and technology on campus. Well, that costs money, and then you pass that on to the students. And now, today, it's like, well, we need to have the best dorms and recreation facilities and athletics. The same thing, like, we're investing in all that, and that costs money, and we're passing that on to the students. And so you're, you have this competition among all the schools, and they're passing out to the students, but the colleges also know something. They know that students can pay any amount of money to come to school. And it's not just for the rich people. Even the poorest person in America can borrow up to the cost of attendance to pay for school. So as long as the universities set that cost of attendance, they can keep raising that. They know that everybody has access to their program. And that's the problem that we have today is that yeah. there's just been this competition and they know that the customers can pay any dollar amount to go there. And so we really have two problems, right? We have to lower the cost of you know education, but then we also need to lower the amount that people should be able to borrow. And then we need to train the customers, i.e. the students, how to calculate whether that amount they borrow is worth it or not. Yeah. So, of course, the student loan uh, companies, there's, a, there's several in the states? Oh, yeah. I mean, there's the fe you have federal student loans and you have private student loans. So all federal yeah. loans are you know, backed by the government. They're government loans. Yeah. Um, they're serviced by third-party companies, but they're, they're government loans. And then you know, there's about, I don't know, 25 different private student loan lenders. If you count like credit unions and banks, there's hundreds because you'll all yeah, have credit yeah, unions. Let's, yeah, but not but, the, yeah, but we can do banks here too, but... Yeah. You have specific like companies that like like Fannie Mae is uh, that's the one right? Well, Fann Sally Mae is the Sally Mae. Yeah, Sally Mae. What's, is, uh, what's the other one? Uh, <laughs> Fannie Mae is a mortgage mortgage lender. mortgage. See, yeah, 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 like yeah, yeah. Uh, that's so confusing, right? <laughs> and they all sound so nice, <laughs> totally, don't right? they? <laughs> it's Sally so, Mae, so nice. So, yes. So you have these companies that are just taking it. Well, like it sounds like they're all working together with the with the colleges and universities, like. Well, uh, yes hey, we'll no. charge more and then we'll give them money. I mean, the other issue in the United States here is that most people don't realize what the collateral of a student loan is. So when you get a mortgage, the collateral is the house, right? Yeah. So if you don't pay your mortgage, well, the bank comes and repossesses the house. Same is true with a car note, right? You get a car loan, you don't pay your car loan, the bank repos the car, right? Yeah. Well, the collateral on a student loan is your future earnings, Mm. And so this is why, on one hand, banks and you know places love lending because historically earnings rise. So like betting on a college graduate, like all the studies show, right? You graduate, you know, high school graduates make one amount and then college graduates usually make double the amount of a high school graduate. Their earnings typically go up, yada, mm. yada, right? So like if you're a bank, like betting on a college student is usually a good bet. But on the flip side, most people don't realize if you don't pay your student loans, the collateral is your earnings. So these banks can garnish your wages. They can take your tax returns. They can take government oh, wow. payments. They can sue you and get a judgment against you to take any other earnings you might get. Like if you did have a house and you sell your house, they could collect some of that money if you had any money in it, right? So the people just need to realize what they're, they're taking a loan out on. And that's what I don't think most people realize so it's not that the banks are in cahoots it's just that you know the schools know how the system works and the banks think that taking a loan out a student loan is a good deal because you know mathematically you arbitrage this out over everybody it, it is a good deal as long as it's done right it's just a tough situation and you got your trillion dollars uh, you know where where does it end right so you you wrote about all this stuff on your blog. You started getting the traction on the, the student loan stuff. Obviously, you're the student loan expert now, <laughs> right? It's pretty clear. Yeah. Uh, how long? Like, how long did it take? Uh, but you're work. Like, where are you working? 
um, you're working full time somewhere I'm else. Full time at Target, yeah. Yeah, I'm, you're still I'm just like doing this. Yeah, the Target. Can, are you still working at Target? Yeah, so I worked at Target <laughs> for 17 years before I left. Yeah, right, that's I, well, that's incredible. I left. Yeah, I liked it. I mean, honestly, great company to work for. I found the job to be pretty easy. Um, I liked who I worked with, so it, that was all good. And you're making decent salary, it sounds too, right? Absolutely. And, not, yeah. and now you have no debt, and you're writing about student loans and how you should pay them off. And the blog just starts getting more traction. Was there like a, a real catalyst uh, that uh, made it take off? I got a couple of catalysts over time, but one of the first ones was just connecting with other bloggers online. So okay. I found a forum. I started networking. This was about the year and a half mark. So I'd already been doing it for a while, and I wasn't getting a lot of traction. But then I started networking with other bloggers and learning about like actually blogging, not just like money. Right. So okay. like, how do yeah. you market a blog? How the, do you the business, yeah. The business yeah. side of it. And then it was yeah. like eye opening. And that was a big turning point for me. Learning that I, I should network. I should share other people's stuff. Then they'd share my stuff. And then, you know, if I link to other people, they might link back. And then like you can, if you share and tweet at people, like maybe they'll share your story like somewhere else. And like, like just learning these basics of marketing went a long way to, to catapulting my blog. And then I went to my first FinCon and I, I had the same kind of thing in person and me meeting and networking with people and learning even more. And, and that these kind of things, this networking and connecting with others and collaborating really was a turning point for my site. And you kind of stuck to the student loan stuff. Was that really your the meat of everything? Yeah, I mean, it was student loans and personal finance. And like I said, I, I just refined my mission. My mission is really helping people get out of debt early, how people navigate yeah. paying off their student loans so that you could start investing and building wealth early. Because we, also, we all know the math. Right, the math's like if you can start investing at 22, it's so much better than investing at 32. I really just wanted to help people find that balance of paying off their debt, navigating this complex world of student loans, and you know, trying to put some extra money towards their investments. They could get out of this in a really positive way. So you learn about the business, and 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 you learn about how to start making money doing this. Eventually, it starts making a decent amount of money that you can think about leaving Target? Yeah. After like I started networking with other people online. So year one, I made no money. Year two, I think the site made about $7,000, which was huge. And I remember like that, my that first month. That sounds like a lot. Yeah. My <laughs> first month, I made like $25 on AdSense, um, which is like yeah. Google, Google ads, right? And I was like, oh my God. And I ran out and my wife was in like the family room. I remember I was like, I made $25. <laughs> and she just looked at me and so she's like, been doing this like a year and a half and you just now made like 25 <laughs> bucks like that's cool like what sounds so, so familiar to me right she's now. like i'm glad you're having this like you know wonderful thing like yeah. meanwhile <laughs> you've devoted hours of our lives to this right <laughs> like but whatever i was super excited and you know she was mildly amused and yeah <laughs> so then it just continued to grow from there and so yeah i actually started making more on the site then i made it my day job before i left my day job for about two years and so you know we just continue to get I'll pay off everything and then save for the future. And then I finally just decided like it wasn't worth it to continue to be at my day job. Even though I liked my day job, my kids yeah. were getting older. We didn't need the income from the day job anymore. So it was like, why, why am I still working nights and weekends when my kids kind of need me now at home during those times? Wow. So well, what kind of traffic, like I think this is uh, public uh, stuff, right? What kind of traffic do you get uh, on the site now? Yeah, so my peak this year um, was about three million visitors so far this uh, in a month, um, and wow. so yeah, and so that was peak tax season, which is always a big deal here in the United States. Um, but usually we're getting like one point five to two million visitors a month, um, non peak tax season. So uh, it's it's great. The traffic's doing really well, and the site's doing really well. That's amazing. And so, do you have a like? Do you have a team that makes content, or is it you still? Or yeah, I mean, I have an all virtual team. So yeah, it's me and a couple writers. I have an editor, a social media person that helps, and but it's all virtual and uh, nothing, nothing real hard. Just still work from home, and I have a, a little WeWork space that I use. And yeah, amazing. And so you you just kind of built this up. So like you hired somebody once uh, the traffic got a little bigger, maybe to help make more content with you and to manage social media. Yeah, that was like my first uh, f like hi hire really was a, a freelance writer to help me write more content. So like I kind of started learning like, oh, this content's good. And then I started getting all these ideas. And it's like, well, if I could just keep getting more of these great ideas out there, we might get even more traffic. And like I was working, right? So it was yeah. uh, I hired a writer to help me try to get more of these ideas out 
on uh, onto the blog faster than I could do just myself. Yeah, so you were just getting excited about this and decided to keep pursuing it and writing about it because you were getting the feedback. Of course, like everyone's like, "Oh, I want to be like Robert." You know, <laughs> how do I? How do I? How do I do that? How do I get you know three million a, a, a month? But it's not like you can just go out and make it happen. It's just something that happens over time and. Of course, the content that you write, like you said, is good and it is. applicable I think it, to everybody. It's interact. Everybody's interacting with it, right? But I think it, you know, if you're going to start today, right? Like, let's just say you're going from nothing and yeah. you want to start it. And this applies to blogging, podcasting, YouTubing, any hobby that you want to turn into a hobby, uh, anything, thing, any creative yeah. thing you want to turn into a yeah. side hustle. My rule of thumb is you need to do your thing three times a week, every week for an entire year. Okay. Okay. Maybe it's two times a week, but you get the the picture. Is it's consistency and time, and if you can do something consistently for a long period of time, and I put the year mark because that's a long enough period of time. Two things happen. One, yeah. you get a lot better at your craft because Absolutely. like your first things suck, whether it's a blog post or a podcast or a YouTube video, it's just not going to be great. But you do this that's for a, a year you're going to be pretty good at it. And you might not be an expert at it, but you're going to be a lot better than when you started. And then number two is that you also have been doing it consistently enough that you probably have a little bit of an audience and that they realize that you are consistent. And so they'll come back and check in more and more. Because what happens so often is like you get a blog or a podcast or a video channel that like starts and they put out like some really great content and then you like it as a, as a reader or consumer of the content. And then you check back in like a week and there's nothing there. And then uh, you yeah. check back in like a month and nothing. Well, that's like they're never going to come back to you. And because you didn't have the consistency to continue, you're not going to build that audience that you could have built if you were just at it consistently. And that's the key. Like here I am 10 years later and I've been consistently putting out content at least three times a week, if not five times a week for 10 years. Wow. And so like even when I first started, I don't think I was great at the very beginning, like for the first, but once I learned about a year in, like it's been at least Monday, Wednesday, Friday, every single week for 10 years, nine years. Yeah. And of course, like it doesn't matter uh, how much you put out if it's not good. So you have to have that, <laughs> that talent in the first place, right? But you don't get good until you do the work. That's <laughs> like, a good point. And that's the yeah. hard part that most people don't realize is that. I mean, you hear it. And I'm not the only one that's ever said this is like, you know, your first sin you put out there is terrible. But the cool thing with the Internet is you just delete it or you edit it if it's not great. Yeah. <laughs> if you don't <laughs> like it, go delete it or edit it or change it or make it better. And so, like, you know, there's definitely options here. You're not putting a book out in print that's going to live like that for eternity. Right. You can change things, yeah. and move things around or iterate and learn. But if you don't start you're never going to get better. Like just get it out there. Right. Right. Yeah. Just, just get going. And, uh, yeah, the consistency, I, I feel it makes a lot of sense to me. Right. Because, you know, I got a bunch of content on my site, but it's not, I'm not consistent with the blogging. You know, I've been doing consistent podcasts uh, weekly, which Mm -hmm. you, I can see the growth there, but, and, but, and the blog has regular traffic, but I can imagine how much more it would have if the people that came that one time two years ago and then came back the next week looking for another post or two days later looking for another post and found it, they stayed and all those people just stayed. Right. I, I can see that. I can see how that would just compound and that's how you get to one to three million people a month. Right. Yeah. Like every blog post, you know, might add one to two visitors or every podcast adds a few listeners here and there. But then the next week you do it again and you get a few more listeners that's plus right. the original exactly. ones. And then the next week you do it again and you do it again. And and so, you know, and then every now and then you get lucky and you knock one out of the park, right? And you get picked up like a media mention or like one of your podcasts that's gets right. shared by yeah. a big influencer and then you get an influx. But then then if those influx of people don't have anything to listen to the next week, they're not going to stay. They're not going to stay. It makes a lot of sense. Stay. And the yeah. only way you're going to get there, it's all an odds and a statistics game at some level, right? So it's like maybe you have a 1% chance of being picked up by like a major media, right? Like I'm talking like the yeah. national oh, yeah. news or a big time yeah. influencer with like 10 million subscribers, right? Sure. Well, if you don't create a hundred pieces of content, 
you're not going to get your 1% chance. You're, you're not going to get that one article that gets shared or that one podcast episode, right? So like you have to do the work to get out there. And you know what? We hear those overnight successes, which, you know, everyone sees like this guy, you know, blogged for three months and is making a million dollars. Well, you know what? Same thing as statistics. Like, yes, there will always be that one person that hits the lottery. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but, but like, they're not. Yeah. They're not the standard. And, right. and uh, the reason I like your story is because, you know, and the reason I like to tell everybody's uh, early story, you just started writing and you figured out you were good at that and you were consistent and you were working at Target. Right. You know, it's not, yeah, it's like, every, it kind of tells you that, hey, just get started because, you know, it could be you and you don't know, right? Uh, would you would you agree with that? I 100% agree with that. And just the cool thing with the internet today is that you can start things with zero cost. Well, like maybe like a couple bucks, but like, like the cost is nothing. It's not like the old days where like, I always like think about like, what was this like in like, you know, the turn of the century of like the 1900s. If you wanted to start a business, it was like, you need to like build a store, <laughs> right? Yeah, seriously. Like you don't have to do that anymore. If you want to sell something online, you could go on eBay right now and sell something or go on Amazon and sell something. Like yeah. there's so many options out there that it takes your time and a lot of people have a hard time committing the time, but if you can invest the time, you can do anything today. It doesn't cost anything. Yeah, you didn't you didn't have like a crazy wealth in your family or, or any kind of special opportunity. You just took advantage of what was there. Exactly. I mean, I started the blog. And wrote about you. You wrote about yourself. I wrote about myself. I started the blog with a, a free WordPress theme. I think I was on one of those cheap, like two ninety five a month hosting plans. Um, I think when I finally invested a little bit outside of the free theme, I paid five dollars on Fiverr to have like a logo created. You yeah. know, like so like there's so many ways to start for cheap. Yeah, that's that's it's great. And and uh so thanks for coming on and telling your story and I uh, I like that you're trying to give back and make sure people don't get into so much debt. I wish it wasn't such an epidemic in the States right now, but you know, you're doing what you can. And that's it. And I think, you know, every if we can get to more young adults and then, you know, as we teach people how to navigate the repayment, you know, the debt's not bad. I think 51% of Americans qualify for some type of loan forgiveness. So, like, you see these debt okay. statistics, but if you're half of Americans with student loan debt, you could get your loans forgiven. But they don't know that these programs exist, and they don't know they're out there. So so hopefully they Google it, they find our site. <laughs> you know, because Absolutely. with money, too, there's such a psychological impact. It takes that motivation and that knowledge to take action. And so, like, when you're drowning in debt, like, hopefully you find that inspiration tonight, and you pull out your smartphone, you Google, like, how to get out of student loan debt and maybe you'll find our resources and start down the right path but it's definitely not an instantaneous thing but there are lots of ways to navigate it successfully so other than google the college investor.com go to the college investor.com or you know pick your social media podcast uh, listening station or youtube if you like to watch we're trying to do more videos over there as well cool awesome thanks uh, thanks again robert this is really great and i'll see you at fincon yeah, I will see you in a couple months, and this was so much fun. And that was episode 87 with Robert Farrington. If you like the podcast and want to see me get to episode 100 and beyond, please support the podcast by going to my Patreon site and becoming a patron. It's only a few bucks a week, but if enough people do it, it starts to add up. Head over to patreon.com slash bowhumphreys if you're interested. I am now offering free 15-minute personal finance consultations online. I'm a personal finance coach. So if you're looking for someone to help you get organized, head over to bowhumphreys.com and click on the banner to book a free 15-minute personal finance consultation. We'll chat about your financial situation, and you can decide if booking an hourly coaching session is something that might help you get moving in the right direction. That's it for this episode. I'll be back next week with Erica Young of TaylorMade Budgets.